First of all, I would like to announce uh, Gordon Wagener, head of design of Mercedes-Benz. He will have a short talk himself for some minutes and then Adam Bly will introduce the panel. So please clap your hands for Gordon Wagener. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Um, great to be here. I want to give you a, a quick insight into Mercedes-Benz design. I hope um, the projection is working, which is it's not. Can you check that upstairs, please? Ah, here we go. All right. So, the future of car design at Mercedes-Benz. Let's have a look back into history. Uh, if you look at that picture, you see um, the Weissenhof Siedlung from Le Corbusier from the 20s, and it's still up to date. Um, in front of that, obviously, you see a car, a Mercedes-Benz, also a beautiful piece of design, but it's obviously something out of this area, out of the 20s, whereas the Corbusier building, you still can buy today even as a fertig house, if you like. New Times, you see the CLS in front of Frank Gehry's Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, and Time Will Tell, which is here the classic car. Actually, creative disciplines move closer together. With digital age, Gehry, for instance, used Isomserve software, 3D virtual software, to design such shapes in architecture, and that lead to new shapes, so all the creative disciplines come closer together. Here's the future. Let me first introduce us a little bit more. If you look at the right side, probably it's hard to read from the back, but this is our product life cycle. We start a production car, five years, we do the first stroke on the paper ahead of the market. We freeze the design three years before the market. So that is actually for design, it is pretty long. If you consider fashion, you have four times a year you have a collection. So quite a difference, not as long as architecture, but not as fashionable as um, fashion itself. Production time, seven years, so on the road, more than 20 years means we are looking at a lifespan of 25 years. So we, and especially for Mercedes-Benz, we have to be long life design. With our research cars, I will show that later, we go even beyond into the future. 10, 15 years, and we want to be provocative there. Oh, forgot one thing, if we go back, this is our design building, the headquarters. It's designed by Renzo Piano in 1998, and it's, as you can see, it follows the principle of a finger, and uh, here's the headquarter, obviously, this is my, where my office is. And then we start with advanced design, go over production design, along the process, uh, workshops, truck, and milling center. Very nice building. Open spaces inside, as you can see. Three floors, ground floor is obviously for modeling. So this is where we put our cars and the sculptures. Then the gallery around that, this is where the designers sit. So they can look down at their model. And um, actually these are measurement tools here, which are hang up from the ceiling. That gives the advantage of being CNC millable. Very unique solution, but very costly as well. Upstairs from where this photo is shoot are the engineers um, area. Uh, a lot of engineers help us to, of course, translate our ideas because we are not doing free art. We are doing industrial design, obviously. Few images out of the people. We have in the headquarter around 400 people, uh, worldwide studios another 100. And there are all sorts of creative people. That doesn't mean they're only exterior designers, interior designers. We have specialists for graphic, we have specialists for software design. If you look in, in, in the cars today, um, there's more and more uh, the monitors, the displays, and so you need to have a smart software solution and a logical one as well. We have modelers, we have fashion designers, um, basically everything. Also, more than 20 nationalities all over the globe. That gives good insight um, on global tastes, and later on, I can show you also our global organization. This is our portfolio. Top is 
uh, passenger cars, Mercedes, Maybach, AMG, and Smart. Uh, this is our passenger car range. But also I'm responsible for Daimler Trucks, which is the biggest truck company of the world. We have Daimler Trucks, we have Freightliner, uh, we have Fuso, so all over the globe. Vans and buses additional to that. So this is quite a big range. Here's our passenger car organization. We are worldwide. In Yokohama, uh, in Tokyo, we have a studio. Um, we have, an, which is that one on the far right. Then we have in Italy, at Lake Como in the center, we have that old villa there uh, on the lakeside, beautiful place. Uh, it is close to Milano to pick up fashion trends and pick up trends from uh, furniture, industry furniture exhibitions. This is why we are in Como. And then last but not least, this is where I worked the last three years, Los Angeles. Uh, actually, we, we moved down to Carlsbad, um, San Diego County, and we have a des big design center there as well. So this is our global organization, and these are our creative islands where people, designers, can just sit and think of new things of the future without the struggle of daily life. Same thing with our truck organization globally. Sindelfing, of course, Stuttgart, uh, the headquarter in Germany, uh, but more exciting locations, also Kawasaki in Tokyo, Sao Paulo, and Portland, USA. So here's the future. Mercedes is not just a brand. Mercedes is the oldest and most traditional car brand. We invented the automobile, and we want to be the innovator of the automobile. What you can see here, are the values, traditional values of Mercedes, quality, safety, solidity, tradition, continuity. This is what we know about Mercedes, but these are the ones from the past. Obviously, we added some more to the future. Uh, passion, fascination, innovation. And what is that? This is all about design. These are the aesthetic values transferred by design. Little look back into history. If you go into the 90s, we had basically three limousines, S, E, C class. Um, that was our core lineup, and um, pretty easy. We had a, they all looked very much alike. We had a horizontal homogeneity, means S looks like E, looks like C. Works with three cars. Then we started from there, two or three product offensives, and created a lot of niche vehicles, which you can see here. In groups, we have the limousines on the top, we have the coupes, roadsters, SUVs, uh, compact cars, all sorts of things, you name it, you know it. So with that, we decided to change our strategy towards this, you, um, yeah, a very characterized look to give each and every model an own identity and character. The group of people and uh, of cars, obviously, but cars, as you can see, are always compared to people because this is what we as humans know. Uh, we look at faces. The face of the car is the face of, 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 ma of a man. And of course, it has certain expressions. And so we want to give every, each and every car an own particular character. And it should be an authentic character, which is very important. Again, Mercedes, the most traditional brand of the planet, uh, is about continuity and innovation. So we always have to look back. Of course, I always have to look back into history, look how does the previous model look, and what kind of jump do we want to do in the future. And of course, also innovation was always, ever since 1920s or ever since the first car was built, is a central part of our philosophy of our company. Because Mercedes has to be innovative and has to be innovative in design. So the key is really in the mixture of both. When we start, we want to create classic cars. Cars which will be shown of the concourse of the future. This is our aim as designer to make this statement in history. Like the Barcelona chair or this Adenauer, what you can see here. And we take that inspiration into the future as you can see here with our ocean drive concept. New trends come up. Ecologic <laughs> style uh, comes more and more. I will show that later. This is an example of our bionic car. And on the 
left side you can see uh, the coffer fish. I actually don't know the English name for that uh, fish, but it's a very efficient fish. It has a great drag, and we uh, have been inspired by that and tried to translate this shape and actually literally, uh, first of all, we built the fish and put it on wheels, and then of course, uh, yeah, uh, that was a very experimental shape actually, and then we tried to put that into a more uh, yeah, car-like shape. And what you can see here is the result of that. It still has a great drag, 0.19, which is fantastic, and again, inspired by nature. I will show some examples later. Luxury style, very important for us as the luxury car maker of the world. Uh, we will see a reinterpretation of luxury. Um, we call it, and this is our motto, green luxury, because we will cha see changing values due to major trends of major green trends, for instance. And with the F700 concept here, we showed how you can make a green car, a, a big car, a green car, which is ecologically all right, but also at the same time, it's very luxurious. And we believe that can go hand in hand. Essential style, very important. Why does everybody love a classic car? You hardly find anybody who doesn't like a classic car. Why is that? I think one part of it is uh, because they have a central shape, a shape that reminds us of things we as humans found beautiful. Beautiful other people, for instance, you know, beautiful woman, beautiful man. And this is a key attraction you have to have in a good car. Avant garde style. We consider ourselves as leader in design. So in order to do that, you have to be provocative. You have to go beyond. I mentioned before with production cars, we are five years in the future. So in the moment, we do our 212 program with concept cars, for instance, these Forschungs cars, research cars. We go even beyond that. We go 10, 15 years into the future. And we explore new things, new technologies, and of course, new shapes to express these new technologies. And we want to be prov provocative and we are willing to take a risk because if you want to be a leader in design, you have to take a risk. You have to go into the lead. What are future trends which are up there, which will affect car design and many parts of design? Individuality. That's, in our opinion, a big part what we will see in the future, especially in the luxury segment, but not only there. We as designers want to give the people an own style, an own character and things to express yourself with, values you are associated with, to express your own individual character. One more example of that. Um, this is a very individual car because it's only built 75 times. Our SLR Sterling Moss um, as um, a revival of the 300 SLR. We can do that. We can go back into history um, because you have to be authentic. This is a key for me of good design, to be authentic. An SUV has to look like an SUV. A sports car has to look like a sports car. And an environmental friendly car has to look environmental friendly. And of course, a Mercedes has to be always look like a Mercedes. Also in interiors, we can also go back into our great heritage history of the most beautiful cars in history. If you see that, there's not much design into these old cars, actually. They have just nice details and, and sometimes that's just enough to do a good design. Sometimes less is more. We're talking about simplicity here as well. Authenticity and material of course for us is very important. Wood is real wood, leather is real leather and um, of course love to detail brings perfection because as a luxury car maker you have to be authentic and you have to have real materials because this is also one key of the success why people buy it. You see luxury products all over the planet and eight out of ten luxury brands come from Europe and people all over the globe buy it because they want to associate themselves with that European luxury style to show their good taste and express it with that. 
That's another major trend. European luxury on this global planet, in the USA, in Asia, we are successful as a European luxury company. And Mercedes is the ambassador of European luxury design all over the globe. One big part, Echo Design. That's a major trend we see here, not only for cars. Just a few examples. Um, first, um, if you go to furniture, we see more and more um, recyclable materials in, in furniture. If you go into fashion, we see more and more alternative materials. And if you go into architecture, you see um, sustainability, energy sourcing, uh, saving um, creations. But the difference to before is it's not in this um, yeah, um, bit eco uh, style anymore. This becomes a major trend in luxury. So it's very highly uh, appreciated by society. And this is the difference. It's a major trend. Also, Echo Design, here are some examples out of other creative fields, product design, architecture. We see this bionic architecture. We see structures. And also in nature, you see a lot of inspiration there. And all of that has good attributes like harmony, optimism, easiness, stuff which paint a bright picture of the future. So again, we really look back into, into nature, and there's so much inspiration back in nature. If you see creatures in the ocean, for instance, here that dolphin, which inspired us for the F700 concept car, because we wanted to create something which looks very efficient, aerodynamic, in this case, hydrodynamic, but and, and translate that into car design, and so create something new, and take this aesthetic from nature. There are other fields, there are many fields, like if you look sand dunes, there are beautiful shapes in water and waves, and that can be a great source of inspiration. And it is the good thing about it. It's two things. It expresses this ecological design, and it's beautiful on the other hand. So that's a great combination. Also in the interiors, I mentioned that before, we will see a, a new definition of luxury. Uh, we showed that, for instance, here in our F700, using natural materials, um, cork, um, fabrics, and, and, and it will change the understanding of luxury in the future. And luxury is about responsibility. And so both of that goes hand in hand. Here I'm showing uh, you an example of our design process on one of our latest creations, the... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this is the concept Blue Zero we showed in Detroit. It's an electric fuel cell car. And um, again, here some inspiration in nature, which we took into that car. Here you see some sketches which show that lightweight structures you find in nature. You can think, for instance, of honeycomb. This is a great invention out of nature. You see that in the seats. You see that in the details of the car. More and more. And here's the finished car. So, to come to an end, I show you a few more <laughs> things. Yeah, 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 I know. I was supposed to talk seven minutes. <laughs> now it's a little longer. <laughs> Just give me three more slides. No, oh, oh, four, it is four. Just shows we are looking into the future. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. um, okay, so uh, to simplicity. Um, So the theme of uh, the theme of our session here is simplicity, and and to try to to try to take this this kind of buzz phrase, this kind of buzzword down to 
um, a kind of tactical and practical level. Let me kind of frame it for very briefly and then turn it over to um, our neuroscientist friend to start here um, and, and try to mix up the conversation here. So when we talk about simplicity, um, and it seems like we're talking about it more and more. We're talking about it in business, we're talking about it in culture, we're talking about it in design. And the question is, why are we talking about simplicity? And it seems like you start talking about simplicity when things get complex. So why are things complex? Um, so we know some of the obvious reasons. We know that things are faster today. We know technology is driving it. We know we have more data available and technology is driving that. So with more data comes more complexity. But at the same time, most of us that are t t trying to solve problems, and whether we're solving problems in business, or we're solving problems in government, or we're solving problems in design, are now dealing with more variables. So there's more things that we're taking into consideration at any given moment. And when you have more things in a system, um, there's more likelihood that you're going to start seeing complexity in the relationships between these different nodes in a system. So it forces us to start thinking differently, and whether that means that we start visualizing complexity in new ways, and we'll see Carlo Ratti talk about and show us examples of how to actually see the world differently in some stunning images that you'll see shortly uh, of how we may actually have a new approach to seeing things, um, or from the perspective of the brain and how we can learn about our capacity as individuals to deal with variables. How much do we have as an ability to deal with multiple things at once before we're no longer able to make rational decisions. Um, and then look at two additional business cases uh, to give us examples of how businesses are trying to take this theme and this pursuit of simplicity um, in this increasingly complex environment that we're living in today and sort of productize it or turn it into business practice. Um, so I'm going to leave it there and try to interject with some questions as we go. Um, but turn it over to Gary to, to give us a, a perspective from neuroscience. There, there, is no, um, there is no system that we know of, at least, on this earth that's more complex than the human brain. Um, so let's start incredibly complex. And, and I kind of want to tackle this question of how much we have uh, available to us uh, within this incredibly complex system of the brain to actually look at variables and at a certain point, we can make rational decisions. At a certain point, we can no longer make rational decisions. So why do we need simplicity? Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gerhard Roth. I'm a brain scientist, and this is the organ I'm dealing with in my research. Uh, I hope everybody of <laughs> you has it in, in your head. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is not trivial because you do not perceive and sense your brain. Nobody knows for sure that he or she has a brain <laughs> because you, you hope you have it. Nevertheless, uh, this is our brain, and this is not very large. It weighs about 1.4 kilogram. It's by far not the largest brain in the um, animal kingdom. There are animals who have 2 kilogram, 5 kilogram, 10 kilogram, but you won't know what they're doing with it. But this is a cortex, which is incredibly complex, and we are thinking and having consciousness and perceiving and so on. And this, uh, this brain contains about 80 billion neurons and 800 trillion synapses. This is quite complex, I would say. This is a highly simplified diagram of the machine <laughs> that drives our actions. So here, in many, many parts, it's succeeded. What we are doing consciously and unconsciously, extremely complex, although brain sciences uh, is roughly understanding how the, all this function. You would agree this is very complex. So the human brain, it was quoted before, is said to be the most complex individual system in the universe. Nobody knows the universe, but the brain is complex in the human brain. It consists, as I said, of 80 billion neurons connected by 500 or 800 trillion synapses, the context, each of which can take up, up at least 10 different functional states, maybe 100. 
So if you calculate it, there are 10 to the 150 possible functional states your brain can obtain. And to remind you, the universe is said to consist of 10 to 80 elementary particles. So you can store everything in the universe with your brain. But it's good not to do it. <laughs> the paradox comes up if you realize, on the one hand, the brain is extremely complex. On the other hand, it always tries to simplify everything it does. For example, strong automatization of actions and of habit formation. Most of what you're doing in your daily life is not done consciously, it's just done. You need not think about it and it would not help because it's too complex. Just to put one foot in front of the other is extremely complex. Nobody knows how it's done. To manipulate with your fingers, to move your lips and everything else, to ride a bicycle or uh, ride a car is extremely complex and you do not even need to think about this. This is paradoxical. Also, when we perceive at the raw data level, it's extremely complex, but what we perceive consciously is strongly reduced. There's a strong data compression here. And the most important data compression is to make sense of something. Here we have the famous Kanitsa illusion. It's a rather complex arrangement of different black and white lines and disks, but what you see is not this arrangement, but immediately a very distinct interpretation, which means there's a triangle that lies above three disks, black disks, and another triangle. Although there is no triangle, just nothing. The lines you see here, just forcefully, do not exist. There's no contrast. But it's so strong that you immediately see a triangle because this is the simplest interpretation possible of this rather complex arrangement. And even if I stimulate neurons in my brain with this non-existing contrast line here, the brain neurons would respond to this non-physically existing line because even at the level of simple neurons, they see this illusion. So the brain always tries to do out of a complex arrangement of perception the simplest possible interpretation. This here, you would agree, something very complicated. And I made um, experiments that for one year or, or even more, people were staring at this arrangement and they could not discover what it is. It is a cow in northern German or Bavarian landscape. Do you, do you see the cow? So, the interesting thing is, this is rather complex. As soon as I describe to you where the cow is, you cannot help seeing the cow and it becomes very simple and you will never forget, forget it in your entire life to see the cow. So, this is the back of the cow. This is our spots on the skin of the cow. This is the left ear, this is the left eye, this is the front of the cow, this is the right ear, the right eye, this is the nose, and this is the mouth. It, do you recognize the cow? 70% do it immediately, and it's not uh, statistically significantly uh, correlated with intelligence. If you see it again and again, you cannot help seeing the cow because it's after extremely complex arrangement, it's the simplest interpretation your brain can make. Finally, making a big jump, decisions. This is one of the most important and, and interesting and complicated things we can do. There are decisions under time pressure and decisions without time pressure. The best decisions we can do are the routine decisions. 99.9% .9 of our decisions are made unconsciously, routinely in, in your daily life. These are the best decisions and they are simple, very simple. Although they are modular, so you learn to deal with a certain solution, certain situation, and cannot transfer it to another situation. This is the 
disadvantage. Then there are, uh, there's an other type of time uh, decision, effective impulsive decision, mostly inappropriate decision. This is out gut decisions, you should avoid them. They're almost always wrong. <laughs> then there are three more decisions without time pressure. They're purely emotional decisions. They are rather good at complex decisions. So you do not know how to decide. We have some emotions, some feelings, some preferences, and you decide upon those emotions. The disadvantage is, although 70% they are good, the strong disadvantage is you cannot tell the details. You cannot justify your decision. You cannot communicate them. This is a strong disadvantage. You just do it by feeling. The opposite seems to be the logical, rational decision. This is the decision we like or we grew up at school, at university. Use your ratio, use your mind, your intellect. However, shockingly, it turned out that these logical, rational decisions are only good at simple situations. Our mind, unfortunately, can deal only with two factors interacting. When there are three factors, you cannot rationally handle them. So keep up in your mind, rational decisions are only good in very simple situations. You should avoid trying to deal rationally with complex situations. What instead you should do is what is called pre-conscious intuitive decision. They are not identical with emotional decision. You discuss important and complex things for two hours. Reduce them to the utmost level. Then stop after two hours, go away. Do not continue to think about them. Just let them sit and wait. After 24 hours, you come back and you decide. This is empirically the best way of deciding in complex situations. Why? By thinking about them and letting them sit, sleep over, you put them into what's called the pre-conscious. This is a gigantic network of 20 billion neurons. And this is highly parallel processing in your pre-conscious, in your cortex, just below our conscious rational thinking. And there it is working, and then it pops up 15 hours, 24 hours, just intuitively. It is not emotional, but the best way of dealing with hyper-complex situations. This is what all the decision makers in high politics and, and economy tell you what they're doing. You should not continue to be rational after two hours. That's bad. Then you turn immediately to effective, impulsive decision. This is the way out and this is a very bad way. So you should stop, not think, and your brain pre-consciously works for you. So, why, where, what are the reasons for this enormous simplification? The brain always tries to reduce processing costs because thinking and rational and consciousness is metabolically extremely uh, expansive. 20 times more than usually the brain is eating up is used for rational thinking. And the, the brain is avoiding this. And, and the brain always eats up 20 times more than it should do as a normal organ. And then again, for rational thinking, it's again 20 times more. Should avoid thinking <laughs> and consciousness. In addition, increase of processing speed is biologically and socially extremely important. In a fraction of the time, you have to find out what's important, what's unimportant. That could save your life in the Stone Age and even in a conference or among your colleagues. And of course, increase of action and reaction speed. You immediately find out what's happening and then immediately decide. So this is what the brain is doing for. It's not for a long time just to strongly reduce complexity so that you immediately know what you have to do with a minimum of metabolic costs and minimum of errors. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, okay, so we're going to try a little bit of an experiment here now for the next few minutes. Um, 
first, we're gonna tee this up with a little bit of a business case um, from the telecommunications industry. Let me, let me start it this way so we understand why this is so interesting. How many people in the world, Christopher, now have mobile phones? Roughly three and a half billion. So a lot of people. E producing an extraordinary amount of data. Um, and so mobile phones suddenly give us the availability of this enormous new pool of data to start thinking about social patterns, to start looking at things very, very, very differently, to extract new business insights, but also new social insights, new cultural insights. And so I'm gonna ask Christopher to just very briefly um, kind of tee up this challenge from the industry perspective. And then we're gonna have Carlo Ratti from MIT show us some work um, actually using mobile data um, and introducing this ex exciting new field of, of visualization and what we can actually see from taking mobile data. So Christopher, please. Thank you, Adam. Well, I just thought about the number and I read it most recently that uh, 50,000 gigabit of digital information are being produced every minute nowadays. Yeah, 50,000 gigabyte of information. And we have to deal with that and reduce the complexity. And I think Gerhard's approach was just fascinating how the human brain deals with that and how neuroscience can also only approach the question of simplicity because I think there's no real answer what simplicity at the end of the day is. It has always been in uh, the philosophy of science being perceived as a meta-scientific criterion and uh, people refer to complexity when they talk to simplicity. And there's lots, lots of good sayings around simplicity but you actually don't find out the truth when you really try to identify this concept of simplicity. I'd li I liked one most of all these perceptions, and that was Albert Einstein talking about a relative concept of simplicity, where he said, we have to reduce complexity to the utmost, but not make it simpler then. So that was the equilibrium, and it also did not tell a lot. So I'd like to take one or two minutes to talk about my industry, which is not particularly famous for simplicity, the telecoms industry and the media and internet industry, and talk about how this industry in essence in the evolution of the ecosystem came from a very monolithic, simple industry producing landline telephony as a signal service to customers only 15 years ago and then exploded in terms of uh, complexity and this was disorganized in a way. It was not organized complexity and now has a huge challenge ahead of it uh, in order to really come back potentially to what we could perceive as consumers in terms of uh, simplicity. And as we all know, and we don't need to talk about it in a lengthy way, technology was the single most important driver to that complexity in the industry. The advent of the internet protocol, the advent of the mobile phone, these three and a half billion phones out there now reaching nearly uh, the global population already, but then also the digital media and all that is something we're all familiar with. And we have to deal with that and it is still a very suboptimal system as we know from uh, our daily routines and experience because things don't connect together and technology doesn't work well. So let's spend 10 seconds on what, where the technology is going and, and how radical the acceleration of the pace still is in, in terms of technological development. And we could look at, for instance, bandwidth. We're talking today 50, 100 megabit per second in terms of a fiber to the home bandwidth, or we are reaching up to seven megabit on a mobile phone in terms of the bandwidth. Very soon already, we will shoot over the 1,000 megabit per second uh, threshold in fixed line and also in the mobile industry in two years from now, we will see speeds of up to 150 megabit per second in terms of bandwidth. Storage and processing power, uh, is of course also accelerating and there's no end to Moore's law in no way. Think about the iPhone today, it has a processing capacity basically like the entire Apollo mission, both on Earth and in space and the iPhone today has exactly the same processing capacity. Or think about storage where in two years from now every conventional personal computer will be capable of storing your entire digital life. Every piece of music you've ever consumed, every movie you've ever seen, every email uh, plus attachment you've ever received can be stored on one single personal computer. So there's no limit to these things and uh, you might ask yourself whether this is useful or not, but it is a fact and we have to deal with it in terms of the complexity. Think about also intuitive user interfaces and how things like the iPhone have already changed that, but we're going far beyond that in terms of device adaptive uh, user interfaces in the industry and all that. So 
technology is a driver and sometimes it also leads to innovation, of course, and this innovation is breathtaking. And think about the mobile phone. We rarely consider it as, you know, something which has not been there for ages, but only now is this phone coming into developing countries and reaching people who have never been connected before, never owned a PC in Bangladesh and have now have access to the information to the marketplace. And um, I think that is interesting. So why do I talk about all that? I talk about all that, that because, as I said, this is suboptimal. And it has created a huge management challenge to corporations like Deutsche Telekom, and we cannot yet cope with that. We have produced hyper-complex organizations around technology, old landline businesses, mobile businesses, internet businesses, corporate customer businesses, and things are not in a dialogue. They don't work with each other, so we have to change corporate organizations, first of all. We have to cut down product portfolios. Imagine in our biggest business division at Deutsche Telekom, we have more than 8,500 8, products in front of the single customer. And only 30 out of these products account for 99% of revenues. So we are loading our systems, our, pro uh, our processes in a way which is not sustainable. And uh, that is also true then for product development. And I think Paula and the team has uh, done a wonderful job before to talk about the eminence of product design and product development and R&D in today's world, but also its social impact already. And we as an industry have to change the entire value chain of what we are doing. We cannot, as a telecoms operator, operate ourselves. We have to open up the ecosystem so that everybody can participate, any internet company out there, everybody who is producing operating systems, devices, is hardware, uh, stuff like that. So we have to open up these proprietary systems, fundamental challenge to us. We have to approach new tools because, uh, you know, intuition and emotion has to come in. The as Gerhard has described that, and to have tool-based innovation, open innovation with perpetual beta systems out there with things like, you know, tool-based scenario techni techniques and stuff like that is a challenge to us. So what in essence is the key challenge in the ecosystem last half minute? Um, we think that we need to connect the ecosystem in the telecoms, media and IT industry. And we as a Deutsche Telekom are talking about a concept of connected life and work, where we have to be able to connect all screens a customer is using, not only the PC, but the mobile phone, the TV set and other screens, maybe in the car or the airplane, in a very intuitive, seamless way, so that any uh, really content, content application can be used in the same way whenever, wherever, and in an, enjo in an, enjo an enjoyable fashion. We need to open up our personal data we do own with the permission of the customer because we have a very good social community in telecoms and we have to you know, provide standardized APIs to have mashups with the social communities out there and we have to open all our platforms in terms of something like uh, the Android market in the new Android operating system or even in the iPhone, you know that. So that is our vision, interconnect things have a new approach to things and it is not an easy challenge uh, for us and we hope to be more simplistic in the future. Thank you. So I think that was a, a great way of sort of framing the, the business challenge and, and as, um, as, as Paolo would say really how do you kind of negotiate this scale independent kind of transformation that we're seeing that technology is driving and negotiated down to human scale where, where actually end users and customers are, can physically interact with things. Um, so let's go in and see what all of this looks like. Um, when you compile all the data that mobile generates, um, and, and now we'll start to see this at, at extraordinary scale, uh, what does it look like? Thanks, Adam. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'll be very quick. Um, Yes, there's a slide. I, I think, you know, what Chris was saying could be a better introduction. Why all of this, this fuss about complexity? Well, th the word is always the same, but we can see it in a different way. So we, s we can see it with new, group of new, new, new glasses, and uh, that is what's making it more complex. Hence, simplicity. And I wanted to start with uh, Lewis Carroll here, um, and then came the greatest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. Have you used it much? I inquired. It has never been spread out yet, said Manher. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. 
So we now use the country itself as its own map, and I assure you, it does nearly as well. Uh, it's very similar to a little story also by Borges about the king telling the geographer to go and map the kingdom, and then one to one, and then the kingdom and the map become the same thing. Well, what's happening today is that actually we're doing a map two to one, three to one, ten to one, keep on adding information onto the physical, this is just Google map, and um, so our point is that we need new type of simplifying this information, new types of mapping, mapping traditional like in Noli in, uh, in 1747, the first sort of modern cartography example, the Noli's map of Rome. Uh, how do we simplify this information? And uh, I'll show you just a couple of examples. Uh, one is from 2006 at the Venice Biennale. What we did there was try to take a city, actually the city of Rome, and try to collect several streams of data, including data from the cell phone network. So we had all the buses in real time, all the taxis, and then all of the people's movement, anonymous, completely anonymous and aggregated, but in real time. And I'll show you something just to celebrate. I'm Italian, so I'll show you what happened in Rome on the night, in a glorious night in July 2006, when Italy won the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup. Uh, apologies to any Frenchman here in, in, in the room. So look at this, this is the most basic type of information, cell phone activity in Rome. You see before the match, that's uh, on the 9th of July 2006, it's a normal day in Rome, you know, activity, people calling. The most basic type of information, just calling behavior. Then the match begins, silence, actually. Everybody's just watching the match. Italy scores, half time, half time, you go to the bathroom and you call eventually. Second half, end of normal time, first overtime, second overtime, Zidane, remember red card, Italy wins. <laughs> <laughs> and then you saw in the night people went to celebrate here and party and the following day they went to meet the winning team here with the prime minister and then they moved here in this part of the city um, actually to have a big party. And you'll see it in a moment with this peak raising. Now this is the most basic type of information. You can then add artificial intelligence. You could do fun things with, with this type of information. I'll skip to another video actually here. Sometimes all of this information we are collecting actually come from people. People really like to collect information to make it public. What you have here is people loading pictures onto Flickr and sharing them with everybody so you can actually look at the Flickr database, look at where the pictures were taken, look at the timestamp, uh, and uh, plot it. So what you see here is Barcelona and you see parties in Barcelona because you apply a little bit of uh, either uh, mining through keyword or you can do a bit of, s of uh, image processing and you can find out actually where the parties are happening in Barcelona and you see the pictures actually taken representing parties um, in Barcelona. I, I will skip it, that's much more it was this was at the Design Museum in Barcelona a couple of months ago. Uh, and um, there's a student now doing a very sophisticated analysis to see the possible correlation that could be that between Brits and parties in the city of Barcelona. <laughs> um, I'll finish with a project we did for Paolo Antonelli's show um, at the moment, exhibition at the moment, Design and Elastic Mind, 2008. Um, and this was in, together with AT&T, one of the partners of our lab. And it was, how does New York connect with uh, all of the cities on the planet? How can we visualize this type of information in real time as it happens? And uh, the variables there, you got time, because this information changes over time, changes over space. Um, you see the white, well, the black is the night, and the white on the other side is the day. You see the different parts of the globe becomes activated at different times of the day. Um, here you see the late night and starting to become night, the black. And uh, through this, actually, you look at the city of New York, how it connects. And you can also look at it neighborhood by neighborhood. I will not sh show it to you today, but you can zoom in uh, and zoom in both at the scale of the city to look at uh, how Queens and Manhattan are branching out of the world into radically different ways, different communities. But you can also zoom in into different countries. Here you see Europe waking up and London and the financial well, what it was, the financial district, and, uh, um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> uh, and then you, got, um, you got Brazil, South America. Uh, I'll skip it, it's all online, just because we are, it's all online just because we are running out of time. Um, on the top of this, you can do a lot of analysis. This is uh, something actually we did for Seed Magazine. Uh, you, can oops, you can actually do a lot of uh, 
uh, analysis and, uh, and find interesting patterns. So we are, we are really trying, hoping to try to answer a big question that cities did not exist a few thousand years ago. You know, all of us, we were hunters and gatherers, moving bands, no cities. And then cities started and uh, why we still keep on building cities, how they grow, that's one of the fascinating questions we are trying to answer with this. Two slides very quickly to finish uh, uh, for two new projects for 2009. One is in you know, we can generate also a lot of new types of data. We've got the cell phone, we've got uh, people uploading information. In this case, we will actually put smart tags onto garbage in your city and then follow garbage as it is distributed through the removal chain. So see the last journey of our everyday objects and then hopefully with this information we will also be able to um, to, to better understand how we can optimize the system. And another project we're doing for Copenhagen, the 2009 uh, UN climate summit in December and here is a bike and there will be 3,000 of these bikes actually collecting information about air quality in Copenhagen and sharing it on the social network for people riding. I'll stop here because I think we are a bit late but uh, thank you. Awesome. Um, and our final speaker um, will give us another business case and hopefully we'll have a little bit of a conversation if we have some time. Um, if not, you'll, you'll see them outside. Um, Jeffrey from Kodak. I will move with the speed of light. Let me, let me ask a question in the spirit of Yossi Vardy and what DLD is about to uh, give you an idea of what it's like to be the CMO of Kodak. How many of you have bought a roll of film, say, in the last year? Raise your hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> there went our profits. Uh, how many of you own a digital camera or a digital camera on your phone? Raise your hand. Welcome to my world. Okay. So five years ago, we began this great transformation, and it reminds me of the first time I met my wife's great grandmother. I'm six foot three, two hundred and eighty some pounds, and my wife is five foot one, about a hundred pounds. And her great-grandmother is even smaller than her. And her great-grandmother looked up at her, then she looked at me, she looked at her, she looked up at me and said, isn't he bigger than necessary? <laughs> okay. So, with my colleagues, eh, I feel that I'm a little bit bigger than necessary. And I want to tell you about a story of transformation because for us, it was about making us relevant again. And it's become one of the greatest uh, turnarounds in all of business history. And five years ago, we were doing $15 billion in that little box. Today, we're about a $12 billion company, and yet $500 million of that revenue comes from that box. And so we had to reinvent ourselves with different types of products to make things simpler. George Eastman, when he started the company, says, "One push one button and do the rest. This is our new HD video camera, pocket video camera that's out that's weatherproof, which is very similar to the one that we did here in terms of its look and feel, we brought to market in less than five months. An old Kodak, the Kodak prior to the, what we call the Kodak 2.0, would have taken five years to bring this product to market. And so I'll talk to you about the simplicity of how we do it, and we call it fast, focus, accountability, simplicity, and trust, so that even if we screw up, we're going to do it faster. And that's kind of our <laughs> motto, okay? So we, we go forward with that kind of attitude and how we want to go, and so now we've got this company that's really changed, but really gotten back to the simplicity of what it was in 1880 when George Eastman first invented photography, or those who did invent it, but he took it and marketed it in ways that we'd never seen before. And so we're bringing it back to that same simplicity and bringing back those Kodak moments and starting to talk about it in what we call M3I squared. Make, manage, and move images and information. Because in the last four years, we made a complete transformation. We've shifted from a 70% non-digital, tra non traditional based, to now over 70% of our business is now digital. We have 19 product lines, 19 product lines where all of the products are number one, number two, or number three in the market. Half of those products didn't exist two years ago. Half. 11 of those products are digital uh, product lines that bring us two-thirds of our total revenue. And put it on top of that, 65% of the people that work for us today did not work in our company four years ago. You have to become simple in terms of the thought. You have to be very succinct in where you, in which you want to go it and start to move the company. And so we brought forward our concept of fast to be able to drive that. We started putting into products that smart capture. Today, 8 out of 10 people take all of your pictures in default mode. 
So we decided to take the 10 most used, the 10 most easiest, or those things that are most difficult to use, and build them into one press so that when you take our new camera, someone was trying to take it, all right, and you take this, this happens to be the new uh, Z980, which is a 24 optical zoom lens for $399, just to introduce it at, uh, <laughs> hey, you think this was for free, okay? I'm going to get every plug we can. You, you showed every damn car you made. <laughs> so I'm going to... I'm going to bring that in. So, sorry. We're all friends. We're all friends. Hey, if you add up the age of their company and our company, you add the rest of you up combined, we still have more years on any of these guys, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> but we build it into one button, and we put 10 functionalities into one button. You press the button, we figure out whether it's the birthday cake in front of you. We figure out whether the light's behind you. We figure out if one face is forward and one face is back all with one button. We make it easy. Simplicity, and we're starting to sell that. We're bringing the, the we tag your pictures. So when you take a picture, you can actually tag it right there. And so we put that in. This is what we call our black fade language, which I put into the cameras about six months ago, and I'm bringing it forward into all of the different products that we have because we, we went out and bought a, a number of companies, and if you put all of our software together, it looked like this giant, giant uh, yard sale that was going on in terms of design and look. In fact, this was the... This was the web page up through December. This, this doesn't, to me, shout simplicity. <laughs> this, to me, does not shout cool, okay? This, to me, shouts bargain basement sale. And so, yeah. And so there, you can even see there's, this, there's the ZI6 right there, 179, that we we're offering. It was big. It was bold and so forth. And I said, no, we have to change it. And we decided to do it and make it much more simpler. And we said, we're going to do that. And so we launched the first of the year this website. And we not only did that, we also, you can see the inaugural pictures that are up there. We went to our core base of people to keep it simple. We went to our photographer, Bob McNeely, who's the White House photographer for Obama. I said, Bob, do us a favor. Let's show people the value of images. Let's show people what they really mean, the stories behind the pictures. Give me some photographs from the inauguration that are exclusive. I'll put them on our website, and people can go to the website and click on it, and you can tell the story of that Kodak moment. We had 93 million unique visitors a day during the two days of the inaugural celebration. Okay? So simplicity works. I apologize I had to leave. I, I caught a little bug at the inaugural ball. I got to tell you, we're so excited about the new president, as most of you are, the only thing that's bad about him, he's a great leader, but he can't dance, okay? I'm just going to tell you if you've watched him dance up there. Okay. <laughs> Come on, you guys have got to lighten it up, okay? <laughs> We've also brought this black fade. So you see the website, you see the design, you see the way in which we're bringing the simplicity to the camera. We'll bring the same down to our picture frames. This happens to be our OLED wireless picture frame that we have. But you can see that thinness, that crisp, the design. You can see a look and feel that's totally different than it was before. I'll turn it back over to our panel so we can have a discussion. <laughs> So we'll briefly wrap it up with two things. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me as you were saying that John, John Maida in his book aptly titled Simplicity, one of the points he brings out is, is often in, in the pursuit of simplicity, especially in design, we forget about emotion. And, and it's important, even in visualization, that at the end of the day, it is human beings who are going to be interacting with whether it's the visualizations or, or product design. Um, we're trying to render them simple and, and to the Einstein quote that, that Christopher brought up earlier, but not too simple to the point that they lose emotion. I think that's a challenge Kodak faces and, and is handling. Um, let me uh, turn it to you, Gara, to uh, give us a couple minutes to wrap it up. Any thoughts you have? And, and yeah. we're going to have to wrap it up there. Yeah, thank you. There are two basic uh, problems dealing with complexity for the brain. The first I did not mention is its own hypercomplexity. And I would need 10 or more hours just to only briefly explain how the brain is dealing with its own the complexity. This is uh, enormously interesting for in, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. I will not mention it. The other is the hypercomplexity of the environment. We are living in a hypercomplex environment, natural and especially social. How is the brain dealing with this hypercomplexity? There are two things. Uh, first is sense, making sense, meaning. Everything is reduced to the simplest interpretation, to the simplest meaning, because meaning means to, to tell uh, you what to do next. 
And the other uh, task is you have emotions and you have intuition, which are two different things. When things become very complex, you either use emotions because this is a certain kind of memory, a lifelong memory that decides without knowing what's behind. This is just 50, 60, 70 years of internal collection of experience. This is so emotions are a short-term expression of lifelong experience, and mostly good. Not affects, not stain o uh, um, stone age uh, affects, but emotion. The other is when it becomes rationally complex, intuition. So these are the two ways to deal with complexity, even in your sectors. Emotions and intuition. There Thank we you. go. We leave with uh, a how-to. Thank you, everyone. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.